Greetings, loyal podcast listeners. I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is no enhanced version this week, but the good news is that there is a follow-up to last week's episode at the end of this week's episode, so you still got plenty of Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show to enjoy, and uh, another enhanced episode coming next week, so don't forget to send your recording of my intro to Jeff Rubin at jeffrubinshow.com. Okay, let's start the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. Today on the old Skype on the phone, I have improvised Star Trek cast members Irene Marquette and Griffin Eckstein, and as if the improvised Star Trek thing wasn't enough, they also both worked at the Star Trek Experience in Las Vegas. Welcome to the show, Griffin and Irene. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Griffin, can you say something just so we, we know what you sound like? We know you're different than me. Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Now that we've gotten the formalities out of the way, let's start with the basics what was the Star Trek experience? The Star Trek experience was a um, ride in Las Vegas. It was a ride and a museum and a restaurant, uh, gift shops. And it was a, a small-scale amusement park f- focused on Star Trek. Is that about yeah, right? It yeah, it had a, um, a museum called the History of the Future Museum which was uh, like props from the movies and as well as like a timeline uh, for all the, uh, from the present day up until the future. And what era of Star Trek was depicted there? Was it old school? Was it next gen? Everything. They treated the, in, they treated everything um, like it was the future. So you had the original series, and there would be like little props here and there in the future. I mean, in the museum. So I think one of Guinan's dresses were in there. The uh, the outfits that those Klingon sisters wore were in there. Uh, as and as far as the design and everything, uh, it was um, set during the exact year, Jeff, twenty three seventy one. Uh, that was uh, the the like the optimum Star Trek time, I guess, like Voyager. Uh, Next Generation and Deep Space Nine were all kind of going on in in that time. So everything is kind of reflected uh, about that when all the shows. So so Generation, um, Deep Space Nine, it had that kind of look to it. And what exactly did you guys do there? What were your actual responsibilities? Obviously navigating the Enterprise around asteroid fields, that kind of thing. But what did you have to do for the restaurant itself? Well, uh, we, we worked on the ride. We worked on separate rides. He, Griffin was on the Klingon Encounter, which was the original ride, and I was on the Borg Invasion. Um, do you want to talk about the Klingon Encounter? Yeah, the, the Klingon Encounter was uh, a, like kind of if you ever were in the, the Back to the Future ride or any of those Universal rides uh, where there's kind of like a live action show. Uh, for about 15 minutes, uh, which is what I did. I was uh, I was in Starfleet. I wore the um, uh, the unitard, the skin tight unitard that zipped up. Uh, but wait a minute, the Back to the Future ride didn't have any. Li- there wasn't a live action component, as I recall. No, but it, it, it they're both motion simulators. So you know when you do the Back to the Future ride, you you go in and and uh, into one of those rooms and you line up on those lines. And there's all the smoke and the videos. And there's like, oh, you have to do something and you have to do it by riding this ride. Right, right. They give it a little plot. Yeah, it sets up the same way. But when you're standing on those lines, all of a sudden the room goes dark. The fog surrounds you, you're disoriented, and the next thing you know, you are in the transporter room of the Enterprise, and they're like, thank goodness you're here, we've kidnapped you from the past because you were one of Picard's ancestors. And then they shuttle you all through the ship, and then uh, they uh, this story unfolds that you're like a crucial, as an audience member, like a crucial member of, and then it ends in the uh, motion simulator ride. I see, so you were part of like the pre-show. Yeah, so oh, so uh, I basically would like come into the transporter room, uh, dressed in a Starfleet outfit, and uh, tell everybody that uh, you know there's nothing to fear. You're in uh, 2371. Come come with me to the bridge, and then we'd uh, escort them down the hall, and you'd actually be on the uh, an exact replica of uh, the Enterprise bridge. Irene, you worked on the Borg ride. What was that one like? Yeah, they built that one maybe uh, six or seven years after the Klingon encounter was 
built, and it was uh, it took place during uh, Voyager. So, it, so that was a more Voyager centered ride, and we were on a space station on like right on the borders of the Delta Quadrant, which is where all the Borg live. And uh, while I'm like bringing people on, I was like the chief, a chief medical officer or something. I honestly, I cannot remember my exact title. I'm sorry to say, I was Lieutenant Stevens. And Griffin I, remembered what year it all took place in. I know. <laughs> Uh, all I know is I was Lieutenant Stevens and I worked at a medical office, uh, I was a medical officer and everyone comes in and then the Klingon attack and you like, we had a room that shook and you had to like really fling yourself against the walls. It was a lot of fun. And there were actual actors in board costumes that would chase you down the hall. By chase, we mean walk extremely slowly (laughs) as the Borg are wont to do. Now, I wikipedia the Star Trek experience, not just because we're talking about it on the show, because I do that with literally everything I think about for more than a minute, and there was a line on the Wikipedia page, you know, sometimes, you know, Wikipedia is supposed to be objective, but sometimes you can kind of feel just a little bit of opinion in there. Sure. And, And there was a line on the Wikipedia for the Star Trek experience, and it said, quote, A participant in both experiences, and they're referring to the two rides here, the Klingon and the Borg ride, a participant in both experiences may think one thing very odd. While the Klingon encounter goes to great effort to utilize Trek staples to justify incorporation of 21st century humans into a futuristic far-off adventure, then in parentheses, beaming, space flight, time travel, no such effort is made to justify participation (laughs) in the plot of Borg Invasion 4D. Would you say that's fair? Yes, yeah, the, the, I like I like to think the Klingon counter had a little bit of soul to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it, yeah, it, I mean, it, it, it very much kind of was like uh, a fun Star Trek ride that also kind of played on the convention of like you're going to to do a amusement park ride, and then it kind of upends that. And and, and it, it, there was a lot uh, taken into account when they were making that. And the the board ride is essentially. Like you walk in and there's like you get ushered down a hall and uh, you you watch a 3D movie for about uh, that's a bulk twelve minutes or yeah something. that's a, that's a bulk of the the thing is just sitting in a the theater whereas the the Klingon uh, encounter was more like live action stuff and we're talking about all this stuff in past tense so if it's not clear already the Star Trek experience no longer exists when did you guys work there we worked there until 2005 so 2003 to 2005 yeah something, something like right? that like a year and a half to years we uh we joined right when uh because we both got hired around the same time what Uh, yeah when they built the borg invasion they had a a big uh hiring push so two weeks of work training i'll never experience this again for the rest of my life two solid 40 hour weeks were spent learning everything we needed to know about the borg watching voyager episodes uh Walking through the museum, like they, they really tried to give us as much Star Trek um, training and information as possible. How to like put on makeup, you know, they, they taught, uh, they were hiring actors to be Borg and they, the, the Borg had to put their own makeup on every day. So it was, it's pretty fun to think that, you know. That was your job. I got to do that, yeah. That was my job. Was there a Star Trek aptitude test to get the job? I'm picturing, like, a sweaty nerd being like, in episode 242. (laughs) No, although the people who worked there were super fans. They came from all over the country to work at uh, the Star Trek experience, like, in any capacity. Were you already in Las Vegas when you started working there? Yeah, we were already in Las Vegas. Uh, a bulk of the a bulk of the people were either super Star Trek fans or uh, old Vegas performers. So yeah. there were a lot of like ex uh, dancers in Vegas shows and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, there was a lot of a lot of good old Vegas history there. Um, old uh, yeah, showgirls and the wardrobe people had been working in Vegas forever. So it, it was a great experience in a lot of different ways. Was anyone there not at all into Star Trek? Any of the employees? Yeah, there were there were a bunch that it was just a job. It was just like, or they were they were like actors, and it was just kind of a day job, and uh, they hated it. And uh, we had a, a break room uh, that we called Ten Forward, and 
they uh, <laughs> there, there was a, a huge big screen TV, and there there were people who would watch Star Trek uh, on the lunch, and other people who would come in on their lunch, like uh, you know, just getting off the floor and uh, being really upset and, and getting into like heated arguments that that like what what are you doing with why are you watching Star Trek on your lunch break <laughs> at Star Trek <laughs> I imagine you know on the other side of that coin there were people who were just so into it that these people that had moved there just to work there what were they like Well I I can think of one guy in particular uh who was working on an amended um, timeline for that history of the future museum we mentioned because he went through there and noticed that there were some inconsistencies or uh, things that were in like dis- things that were presented on the show later on that uh, changed things that were earlier in the timeline or things that were mentioned in later episodes that sure, were a retcon. Time- yeah, he was wor- that was a big project he was working on all of his breaks breaks between shows, lunch breaks, he was working on improving this timeline. Did anyone ask him to do that, or he was just like, this timeline's busted and I'm here to fix it? Yeah, he it was, was... a mission, a yep, personal mission. Yep, yep, no, no, no pay, no, no one asked him, no, no extra, you know, anything. One of the biggest uh, fans of the Star Trek experience who also worked there, I mean, it was a really important thing to a lot of the people who were employed there. Um, more, I think that was the case more often than not, but there was one guy who videotaped so much stuff. Like he was constantly filming backstage and on breaks while things were going on, like making little movies, uh, during the breaks up in the ride. And since the experience has closed, he's been putting all of them together into episodes. There's a documentary online. Is that that guy? Yeah, yeah. Vernon Wilmer. Star Trek My Experience, I think. I probably should have watched that in preparation for this interview, but uh, frankly, it's rather long. It's, it's very long. It's like, yeah. it's like, I think it's like 12 parts, and each part is like an hour and a half to two hours. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of it for uh, something where the experience was apparently two 15-minute rides. Yeah, and 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 that this is this is pretty pretty intense. This is an intense viewing experience. I haven't watched it. I, I, I think I watched a little of it. Yeah, I, I watched some of it too. It's uh, it, it's pretty like true to what the what, what it was like to work there. He he's got a lot of great um, background footage and uh, pictures and stuff. So it's cool for people who are fans of the experience or who want to check it out. That's probably, like, the biggest resource. If you are really interested in it, and this podcast isn't enough for you, and say you want it to be 12 times longer, (laughs) but at the same time, you know, that place isn't open anymore. Uh, That was probably the, is that the mecca of Star Trek? You know, the, uh, the, the number one Star Trek vacation destination? It probably was, right? Yeah, it was. And, and every year they would have the, um, they, they actually, uh, to the point where they have the, the big convention was in Vegas. So they kind of made the official big yearly, I mean, uh, like Uber convention that, that everyone would kind of go to. Uh, so it's, it's cool that that guy documented it so well that, um, you know, that it, it still lives on and you can learn, I guess, every detail of what went on yeah. there. And, and there were people that were, I mean, it, just as far as people who would come to the ride, there were there were a ton of people who were just kind of regulars who would stay there all day. What would they do? Just ride the ride over and over again, hang out in the uh, in the museum or, or at Quark's, which was the bar. Was there Star Trek-themed food and drink? Oh, yes, there surely was. They, they had, um, uh, they had drinks that had dry ice in them. There was the, what was the, the, Borg Sphere? The Borg Sphere was like a dry ice drink that uh, got a lot of people drunk. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then they would ride the ride all day. Yeah. Because so, one, one, one uh, you, you pay for the ride, you get to do two rides as much as you want. So people would get pretty hammered on Borg, Borg Spheres and, <laughs> and ride the ride. Uh, yeah. A lot of famous people would do that. There's, yeah. there's, uh, uh, there was a ton of people that would, would come through and they, they, a lot of them were hammered. We just recently figured out, uh, this fun fact. W- there, there was a time on the Borg invasion that they closed the ride down because Shinzon was coming through and everyone was like, Shinzon's coming, Shinzon's coming. And we were like, yes. So we did a show 
that was just the guy who played Shinzon and his two friends. And this came up recently. We had no idea that Shinzon was Thomas Hardy. Yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting. Shinzon was wasn't he the bad guy in um the last Star Trek Next Generation movie that was quite bad? Nemesis. Yeah, Nemesis. Yeah. yeah. That was Tom Hardy? Yeah. And he got drunk and rode the rides? Yes. Yep. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. I wonder if he's doing that this summer on all the Batman rides and all the Six Flags. <laughs> we can only hope. What other celebrities <laughs> came through there? Um Jason my, Alexander? Yeah, he's a, he was a big Trekkie. He went through. Um all of the like the the what's the family guy? Writer Seth MacFarlane, him and him and all of the uh, like Seth Green and those guys, they would come twice a year, and they would basically get hammered and, and ride the <laughs> ride and, like all day long. Uh, who else? Uh, Mike Myers, Patrick Did he come Stewart. Through? Yeah. Oh wow! Oh, uh, Jerry Ryan. Jerry Ryan. Yeah. I and imagine that- a lot of Star Trek cast members, right? Yes. Yeah, Patrick Stewart came with with his kids. Uh, and he kind of had his baseball cap down and kind of wasn't looking at anything. <laughs> yeah, I of bet. Course, because he's like, oh man, that's the best place for Patrick Stewart to be. <laughs> and no one recognized him? No, no yeah, no one. He, he kind of had his hat down and then kind of like, it kind of like someone noticed and they were like, was he here? Yeah. He must have had some sort of holographic disguise machine. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, oh, the, the only weird one was uh, Scott Bakula came when, when Enterprise was on. Uh, and and everybody had to kind of like clear clear the hallways or anywhere. He no one could no one working could 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 look at him or what? Yeah, I, it I was, was one of those. You can't look at him. Yeah, I was I was in the back waiting for a ride to come oh out, gosh. and I, they, I had to go into a closet for five minutes <laughs> when he was when he was like passing through. <laughs> Maybe he was, like, role-playing. You know, he was trying to get into the role of Archer, and he wanted to pretend uh, that was really him. Yeah. Did that happen a lot with customers and visitors? Were there people who came in uniform and pretended they were on Star Trek? Yes, there were. There is one, uh, there's one guy in particular. I think he was maybe 17, and his father was a doctor, and would... Dr- he, You know, Vegas is a really big convention town, so... Um, his dad would come to town several times a year on conventions and he would just buy his son an all day pass and the kid would ride the ride all day long. And he had a uniform and a phaser that I swear was better quality than what we had. (laughs) And he made it himself. He like whittled this phaser out of a hunk of wood and it was great. And like, we would include him in the shows and he must've had the time of his life. That sounds so fun. Yeah. He was a nice kid. There was a lot of that. I mean, you know, it can. What What was your experience like with that? Oh, they, I remember that guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, there were there were people with like ears on or just any. And then there was uh, uh, Halloween. They they would have like a ton of people would come in costume, and, and that was that was when it got kind of crazy. Or convention time would be huge. There would be uh, you know tons of Klingons speaking Klingon, uh, <laughs> and uh, we re- really weird obscure aliens. Every once in a while, an Abraham Lincoln. Uh, yeah. You would have, uh, I think the floor characters would get this more often. Every once in a while, they would um, get us on the rides. But uh, some super fan would come and, like, try to trip you up or, like, ride the ride a few times and, and pick out um, things in the script that were inconsistent or things that, like, the actors said <laughs> to call you out on it. Yeah. Oh, and, and and by floor characters, when Irene says floor characters, there there were a bunch of people that were just uh, their job was to dress up uh, as like a Klingon. We had a, a few Ferengi, uh, and uh, we had what else? An Andorian, mm-hmm. uh, and then some Borg, and they would kind of like walk around and, and talk to to the customers. Uh, and, Give them a little sass. Take yeah. a photo. You know. So these people were in costume, but were they in character? Were they like saluting you and pretending they were aboard the uh, Enterprise? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would happen. And you had to take, I mean, that was part of your job. You kind of have to take it, you, you take it seriously. And, you know, if someone's wearing a certain number of pips, like you, you try to refer to them by their rank if you can. And most of the time, people, wasn't that the joke? Most of the time, yeah. no, everyone's a captain. No, everybody's like an admiral. <laughs> everybody's picked out. Like, no one comes as a, like, you know, no one comes as like a uh, lieutenant or uh, ensign. Everybody's like admiral, like just pipped out of their minds. <laughs> 
We haven't really talked about how you guys arrived there. Were you, I mean, were you Star Trek fans before you worked there? Yeah, we both were in our own ways. I watched all the movies with my mom when I was a kid. My mom was always really in, into sci-fi. And I think, uh, I don't know which movie came out in like 1993, but we went to see it in the theater and I loved it. And she had been a real big fan of the original series. So we watched all of the movies and then uh, we watched, we started watching Next Generation all the time. That was like pre-X-Files in terms of my um, sci-fi television development. I measure all major events in if they're pre or post X-Files. <laughs> that's, kind, that's kind of my BC. Good. Yeah, me too. <laughs> what about you, Griffin? Too bad. Of uh, uh, I was uh, yeah I was pretty I was a pretty big nerd uh, uh, when I when I moved from uh, New York to Las Vegas uh, it, it, during this like the beginning of the summer one year and I think that was the year like Next Generation came out uh, so so I didn't really have a lot of friends so I just kind of watched Star Trek and that that's kind of how I got into it uh, and then uh, I was super into it. Went into conventions and, and whatnot when I was when I was like you know in my like eight to maybe eleven or twelve. Uh, my mom used to take me to conventions uh, and stuff. And then I got into junior high and high school and kind of like didn't really care about it. And then uh, later on, watched the movies, enjoyed those, and and then uh, and then now now I've come to terms with I, I pretty much like it. I watched Deep Space Nine like maybe five years ago, all the way through, and I kind of love that. I'm also not sure that we've mentioned that you guys are married. Very important piece of information here. It is an important piece of information. Yeah, we are married. <laughs> Wait a we second. <laughs> Did you guys meet working at the Star Trek experience? No, we we actually met at an improv show a few years before we started working at the Star Trek experience. Um, we met at uh, Second City was doing a show in Vegas at the time, and the cast would... Uh, to blow off steam on their night off, they would go to a coffee shop that was across the street from my apartment at the time and do uh, it just like a goof around improv show. And I'd never seen improv before like that. So I started going all the time and we ended up meeting there. And yeah. And a lot of our friends uh, who uh, we uh, would take his Second City classes with and stuff, they all worked at Star Trek. Uh, so when we decided that we wanted to move to Chicago, out to Chicago together, we uh, we kind of it was a pretty good paying job, uh, and uh, I think we we both auditioned so we could save up money for like a year and a half to move out here. Yeah, and it was one of one of the few steady acting jobs in Vegas too. So it, there were a lot of like a lot of the people involved with. Um, comedy in Vegas worked for Star Trek and it, it was just a great place. You hang out with your friends and everybody's kind of in the same boat. And, uh, you know, we were, we had each other. It was really, it was nice. It was a good, um, good place to work. Were your characters at the Star Trek experience married? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, they were on separate ships. Yeah, I, I rarely saw, we worked together, but I, I, she was on the, the Borg side and I was on the Klingon side. Um, so we never we never really saw each other. Even our lunches were different. So we would. Yeah. I mean, I, I could work uh, a week and not see Irene at work. Did that put a lot of stress on your Star Trek relationship? <laughs> <laughs> kind of towards yeah. the end there. Yeah. <laughs> could people get Star Trek married at the Star Trek experience? Oh, yes. oh I'm, I'm so happy. <laughs> yes. hey, can you guys talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, well, there was, I mean, we had the Enterprise uh, Bridge, which was probably the biggest attraction there, uh, to the point where, like, you could take pictures uh, on the bridge, um, and, uh, like, every every two hours, we would have people uh, take um, take pictures. We'd shut the ride down, and, and people would, would take pictures of them in the captain's chair. What we also did with the bridge was people would get married on the bridge, uh, and most of the time, it was... I mean, multiple, maybe three or four a day. That many? Yeah, that many. Because uh, you didn't see them because you were on the um, yeah. you know, the other ship. I I thought it was maybe like a couple of weeks. I had no idea. No, it was, it was quite a few. That's amazing. Um, and uh, a, a lot of them, um, sometimes the priest uh, would be dressed up. Sometimes, uh, most of the time, the bride and groom would dress up. They dress up at most weddings, but here it has a different meaning. Exactly. Yes, yeah. Uh, and then, and then some people would kind of like get into it and, and some people, sometimes you, you visibly felt uncomfortable because obviously one of the, the people getting married was way more into it than, <laughs> than the other. 
Um, uh, and that always was awkward. But I mean, you could request characters, uh, the floor characters be a, be there and or marry you because I think one of them had a yeah I think you could have like a Klingon officiate your wedding but you could have your pick like I could have a Ferengi officiate my wedding because I'm Jewish <laughs> I think only be a, a, your witness I think there was one guy who was actually could could marry people who got his like whatever license uh, uh, and and was able to marry people I think that was a Klingon I imagine people came from all over just to get Star Trek married there in the eyes of the Federation. Do you have any idea? Would you remember how much that cost? I do not. I wish I. I wish I knew. Like, what's it, what's it cost to rent out the bridge? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it was crazy money. There was a ton of stuff you could like add on, like char- like characters were more. Yeah, you you had to pay per character, per photo. Yeah. How I mean, fo- a photo on the bridge was like 25 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, but who's going to the Star Trek experience and isn't getting a photo in the bridge? Exactly. Yeah, everybody did. Yeah. <laughs> you guys didn't get married on the bridge, did you? No, we didn't. That would be getting married at work for you. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> we did, um, you, you know, they, they put the Borg ride, uh, they used to have two Klingon encounters, and one of them was a like a mirror version of the, not like a mirror universe, but a, um, everything was flipped around. So, uh, to how it should have been on the original, um, enterprise. So when they kind of repurposed all of that space for the Borg invasion, they kept the old bridge that where everything was reversed. And I think they used to do some pictures over there But they also, I just remembered this while you were talking about people getting married. There was a year that they projected the Oscars on the view screen. And everybody who was working that Sunday would, uh, on their breaks, go sit in your uniforms and watch the Oscars from the view screen on the weird bridge, which is pretty awesome. So in the end, it sounds like working there was fun. It was fun. Yeah, it was a pretty fun time. Was there something you had to do to keep it fresh, or it was just always good? Uh, no, I mean, I mean, you, we'd we'd end up doing like um, uh, an average of like one show every half hour, mm-hmm. almost. So, I mean, uh, ten minutes with with uh, people coming through, and then the rest of the time, I, I read a ton. Uh, just, I, I read a ton on the bridge of the Enterprise. Uh, I slept in the con chair a lot. Yeah. In between. So, I mean, uh, but as far as like getting enthusiastic uh, about, uh, you know, getting people home back to their timeline. Uh, <laughs> some, it's like, no, yeah, yeah. I, I think there was a lot of like effects that you kind of had to, that you couldn't kind of phone it in. Uh, there was a turbo lift after you went to, um, on the bridge, you had to go to a, into a turbo lift that kind of shook. It w- went into free fall because uh, we were getting attacked while you were on the turbo lift. So, uh, so I mean, the lights are flashing and the thing's kind of shaking you all around. So you kind of have to like scream and holler. So that it, you, you had no option. The thing that is funny about that turbo lift is that in uh, the years that the ride was running, the um, the moving that, that it did became less and less. And didn't they discover that it was because the groups of people were getting heavier and heavier? <laughs> oh, that's so sad. And it was like it blew the shocks out or something. So you, it like it didn't. It, it barely shook. There was a time where it barely shook, and you really had to like fling yourself from side to side. It sounds really fun, and it sounds <laughs> like there was an audience for it, and that they knew about it. So why did it close? Uh, you know, I, there there were a lot of. Rumors and Klingon it, lies. It was all Klingon lies, <laughs> and it was especially perplexing to the people who worked there. I think because it closed maybe six months before the reboot m- movie came out, and before like everybody got really psyched about Star Trek again. So well, maybe maybe like a year, and then like like after about eight months of it being closed before the the uh, the new movie came out. Um, there was enough interest in the new movie and they thought it was going to be enough of a hit that they were going to build a new one, like a new Star Trek experience in Las Vegas. Oh yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm not, I just think that the numbers slowly went down. There were, there were peak times, but, uh, I think that uh, it was also something that Vegas was very much geared towards, uh, at a time, uh, family friendly, uh, Vegas. And a lot of those things just failed miserably. 
Uh, and they all came out around the same time. There was a uh, MGM uh, theme park. Grand Adventures? Yeah, there was... Uh, like, I remember it, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was... There were quite a few, like, uh, Circus Circus built, like, this Adventure Dome. Uh, there was a lot of, like... I went on my first roller coaster there. Really? Oh, really? Yeah, first upside-down roller coaster. I remember it very well. So in How my mind, that place was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I worked at the Adventure Dome for uh, a summer. Uh Doing, um, doing this like uh, the, 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 there was this like pirate thing where I was I, I acted as a pirate for <laughs> for like uh, a summer. Do you uh, remember the upside down roller coaster that they had? I do. Was it good? It was. It was decent. Yeah, we, we actually uh, my senior year of high school we rented that place out. Uh, the senior class did, and we had a whole night there. And I think we rode that roller coaster twenty times. Awesome. I feel yeah. like I just like I, I just like ask someone about an old friend I haven't seen in a while, and I'm like, thank God they're okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny you mentioned though that um, they closed it down right before the new Star Trek came out because, especially with that new movie, I feel like there's kind of been a next gen renaissance lately. I think Netflix is a big part of that too. Yeah, yeah. And didn't they um, restore all of those? Yeah, for yeah, they're a while. releasing them. But I think that's an effect. Like, that's happened recently, I think, because more people are getting into it. And it's always had an audience, obviously. Yeah, and, I, yeah, for, it, it's getting pretty popular again. The, um, I, I know, I, I just think because sci-fi in general, I feel like, is, is getting more uh, acceptable to, to watch it with, like, Lost and Battlestar. Yeah, well, I feel like Star Trek was uh, very ahead of its time compared to shows that are on today. Um, you know, I feel like if they did it now, it was very serialized and had this complicated mythology. Uh, and, you know, there were characters that grew and changed from episode to episode. And that's kind of what's popular now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I know that, like, uh, I mean, even five years ago, they, they, they weren't even considering restoring Next Generation because there was just no interest in it and they wouldn't make money. But now since they're restoring, it means that there, there is definitely interest in that, that they can actually make money. Re restoring it and bringing it out. So, yes, yeah. I have a confession to make. I never watched much Star Trek until recently. I'm part of this, as nerdy as I am. And if you've been listening to the show, you know uh, I have some interests. But um, <laughs> Star Trek was never. I never got into Star Trek. I think I always drew a line because I knew, as nerdy as I was, at least I wasn't into Star Trek. It's like not doing heroin. Like I'm afraid I'd like it too much. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely, it definitely is where that line is, I think. It's, it's always, it's always felt like that. But that yeah. line has been blown away in the past <laughs> 10 to 5 years. Uh, I mean, that line has completely moved from where it was when I was a kid. And uh, I've watched some Star Trek, and uh, you know, it's pretty good. Yeah, it is. Do you think that's the Ron Moore? I think, yeah, I, I don't know. There's some really good stuff. It's it's soap opery. It's it's like it's nice. Yeah. It's like old friends. I it like is. to visit old friends. It's, it's true. like a hangout, <laughs> like a hangout movie or like, you know, you you I turn it on sometimes. I mean, I don't watch it that much anymore, but I will put it on every every once in a while just if I'm doing chores or or something around the house. Uh just because it's it's comforting. Yeah. So those guys, it's like, oh, Riker still has a beard and thinks he's a lot sexier than he is. <laughs> That's interesting because you, you seem to have this nostalgic attachment to it, too, because you've watched it for so long. I'm into it. Even I don't have that attachment. Like, it doesn't feel warm to me. I'm like, ooh, who's this guy? Uh, and it's still good. And I think it was maybe just a lot of it is that these were it was kind of the biggest game in town for sci fi for 25 years. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the writers went on to do a, a ton of stuff. Like Ron Moore did. Uh, I mean, even if you watched, uh, have you watched Deep Space Nine at all? I have not. Okay, so it, it's very like it, you can watch that, and and but you can see a lot of uh, themes that come out in Battlestar Galactica, uh, which which I loved, and I think a lot of people did. Uh, so you, you can you can kind of go back and go, oh wow, this is this is pretty intense. My understanding is that Deep Space Nine is the most like these present day TV shows and it's heavily serialized and there's a beginning, middle and an end to an overarching plot line. Yeah, there is. It must have had to have been the biggest fan to be able to follow that in an era before DVRs and before Netflix and before the internet to follow a show like that on cable where if you just miss an episode, you just got to wait a few months for it to come back around or buy an enormous VHS box set. Uh, I admire that devotion, old school Deep Space Nine fans. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I feel like I feel like that might have even been before, or maybe the, around the same time as Buffy. And it's and, earlier uh, than Buffy, isn't it? Yeah, but I think I think they started like heavily serializing it uh, uh, around the same time Buffy did, and then around the same time, like maybe a, a little after twenty. That, I mean, that kind of led to twenty four and a lot of the other because uh, there was a while TV shows were pretty much Law and Order, open done episodes. Uh, and I think Star Trek was one of the, the Deep Space Nine was one of the, the, you know, let's follow a story for seven seasons. I mentioned it briefly at the top of the show, and I think it's come up a few times since. What exactly is Star Trek improv? Um, that's something uh, a show me and, and my friend Charlie McCracken one night just kind of was like, well, let's do a midnight show. We just wanted to do a fun show. Both of us were uh, doing Heralds at uh, Improv Olympic, IO, uh, and... Um, uh, on different teams, and we just thought it'd be fun to do something kind of stupid and culty, uh, like kind of get like a like maybe like have a like a Rocky Horror type uh, cult following um, or vibe to it. So we decided to uh, do uh, an improvised Star Trek uh, show. It's about a forty-five to a, an hour show uh, at IO. It was a stage show. Um, it's currently going on now, but it, we ran for almost a year, uh, maybe a year and a half ago. Yeah, well, about yeah, about two years ago, we ran for for a while up there, and after the run ended, it, and it was so fun. Everybody in the cast, um, you know, we all came up with our characters and our function on the ship, and and we have uh, we're we're all on a ship called the Sisyphus. We're like a ragtag group of ne'er do wells. We're always getting into hijinks and trouble in a Star Trek kind of way. And after we did the stage show, we all had so much fun. Um, Chris Rathjen and Nick Wagner uh, got everything together to do this podcast. And we've been meeting in our living room, Griffin and my living room, for the last like year and a half, recording every Sunday, every Sunday morning a couple episodes. And they've been editing them and putting them up, up online. And we decided to do another live run. So that's where we are now. How do you record an episode? Is it just like doing the live show? Are you all sitting down? Is there a difference between the two? Um, yeah, the, uh, the the podcast seems to be uh, a little quicker. The show was like 45 minutes to an hour, and, and we can kind of be active and uh, kind of run around uh, a lot and be physically funny, whereas uh, the, the podcast we're, we're trying to get in under um, – around 25 minutes. So, so it's a lot faster. It's a, it's a lot quicker than the, the stage show, which we could, uh, we tend to, you know, um, get well, lost in some minutia occasionally. Well, well, yeah, we go a little farther out, I think with the, with the stage show. Cause we do have that whole, we've got a big stage to play with up in, in that theater and, uh, it's at midnight and things are just a little bit looser. Uh, we would, I, I would say we met for, I don't know how many months we met um, working on the podcast, just kind of getting into the getting into a groove of improvising without being physical um, and uh, f figuring out how to communicate with each other in that way. It, it, it's a it's a very different thing, I think. Yeah, and we, and we realized uh, that what what we could uh, what we could make up for in the podcast that the the stage show doesn't have is like we we can kind of go out with sci fi premises a, a little more. So our our uh, the sci fi element of 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 the narrative that we're we're um, doing is a lot a uh, lot more fun and kind of out there because uh, we can because we can basically do anything. It's it's really easy to um, um, convey time travel in a podcast because I mean, we're not worried about how are we going to show people this? Uh, we're just kind of in the time and, and we can play that, uh, or anything really. So, so the podcasts tend to be more sci-fi premise heavy. I also think it's cool that you guys take the suggestions for the podcast version via Twitter or right. Twitter. Yeah. Twitter and, and Facebook, our, our Facebook page. We, we, we do it like the day before. And then we, we, uh, I think we, we usually get like 20 or so suggestions, uh, at least, and then and then we'll just kind of say them out loud when we're about to record, and then we record an episode. Yeah, we'll do a warm up. Uh, pe people usually bring snacks, and we're sitting, we're snacking, we're reading suggestions, and then you know we get to pretend we're in space while we're sitting on my couch for 
for a half yeah. an hour. It's pretty fun. It's pretty fun. What are the rules of improvising within Star Trek? What do you have to do to make it a Star Trek show? Um, just, just that, uh, I mean, that, I mean, we have the, the ship set up, we, we have, uh, characters that we, we play and set designations. So that's, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. We, we have a lot of guests, uh, from the, the Chicago improv community, uh, that have performed in the stage show and the, the podcast. And some of them know a, about Star Trek and some of them know nothing. Uh, and, um, they're kind of some are hesitant that they won't know what to do because they know nothing. But I mean, we pretty much have that covered. Yeah, I think the the biggest thing is that it's a shared vocabulary, uh, we, we, and we we know um, it's a set location, it's a set uh, vernacular. We know that we're going to be maybe in in trouble or visiting a planet or dealing with something on the ship. It's, I, I feel like I don't worry about it that much. You know, I've got my character and doing the same character for the last two and a half years or however long it's been, has been really interesting. I haven't had that experience with any other show that I've done. And that's been really fun too. How has the character grown? Uh, well, my character is Lieutenant Lady Cola. She's the head of security. And uh, the initial idea was that she was a human who had been raised on Ferenginar and uh, because her parents were capitalists and they didn't want to be part of the Federation. So her like teenage rebellion was going to Earth and joining Starfleet. Um, but all like because she had grown up on Ferenginar, she had some really weird ideas about uh, feminism and what her role as a woman was. And because like she'd made this drastic action as a rebellion, like she's not very good at her job and I don't like, she doesn't take it that seriously and she's trying to find herself. So it's been, I, I don't know. It's been really fun and really goofy. And like sometimes Lady Cola goes through some really dark days. She goes through the darkest days maybe on the ship. She's also, she, she was also writing a lot of silent poems um, she runs the open mic night now that our counselor has left. Uh, and yeah, I think, I think maybe that's, that's the biggest thing. Her, her growing and coming into her own through that weird set of, um, circumstances has, has been really fun for me. And to think about like how to change her, um, and how to like, how to stay on top of that every week and kind of like just make it a thing that I have regardless of what is going on during the show has been a really fun experience. And Griffin's character, Fritz, is awesome. <laughs> you can tell him about it. Griffin, what's Fritz like? <laughs> oh, Fritz, it's, uh, my character's uh, the chief engineer. His name's Fritz Fassbender. Um, and he uh, is named after two German directors. Uh, <laughs> and he uh, he's basically a uh like a puck like entity on the ship uh he he'll either destroy it or his, his thing is that uh he he loves space but he he hates space as well and uh the reason why he's uh an engineer on a starship is because he hates space so much he's building ships to defy space uh so that's kind of his outlook uh he likes trying to steer the ship into black holes and uh yeah, he's just a very mellow. He's married to the ship. Uh, that's how his character has grown. Uh, he's really into sandwiches. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's about it. It's cool that your show is serialized, much like Star Trek, and that there's these characters who grow and things change. And one of one of the uh, coolest things I think about this the the whole improvised Star Trek um, world that we've created is because it's just a gang of nerds that have put this together. The documentation on what we have done is so it's so complete and so available. They um, there were synopses made of every single live show we did from the original run. All of the podcasts I think have. Uh, also have a synopsis online. There are detailed character information. Uh, this new Star Trek run, or this new live show run, I'm sorry, um, has, we're also keeping track of that. So when we have people 
guest onto the show, you know, we all go, we go around the room and it's like, my character has done this, this, and this. Uh, I've got a Klingon woman in my quarters that I wanted to dance off. I've got phaser mice that help me get dressed in the morning. Um, we've got a haunted deck. There's an attic where Baxter, our captain's grandmother's wedding dress is like, we've got, we've created a mythology of our show and we try to stay true to it because we're all so nerdy. (laughs) Have you guys ever performed at the Star Trek Expo? No. That seems like it'd be such a hit. Yeah, we we it's it's discussed every once in a while, and then and we, then we decide uh, that we're not going to do it. Well, I don't know if we decide that we're not going to do it, or we just haven't like. Tr- we should try to do that. We should try to do it. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Sold. We're doing it. <laughs> Where is this podcast located, and when can people come see the show live? You can see the show midnight at, on Saturday at the IO Theater in Chicago, formerly Improv Olympic. And uh, we're on Facebook, facebook.com slash uh, Improvised Star Trek. Yeah, and then the Improvised Star Trek.com. Uh, you can search us on iTunes, just Improvised Star Trek. Uh, it has all of our episodes. I believe we have like over 50 now. Um, yeah. So uh, I think it's like two seasons. Uh, we we, we kind of do it like uh, like the the twenty four episodes, and then it's an, a new season. We've been kind of following that. I listened to a few of them before this interview, and they were great. It's really funny. Everyone should check it out. I love that you guys used to pretend to be Star Trek characters as a job. Now you're just doing it out of the love. <laughs> I think people should check out this show. Uh, thank you guys for talking. This was great. Oh, thank thanks so you much so for much, us. Jeff. This was awesome. All right, everyone, don't stop listening yet. We have a follow-up to the pop culture conspiracy theory episode that Pat and I did. I am here again with Pat. Hey. And also with our friends and coworkers, Kevin Corrigan. Hello. And Dan Gerwich. Hi, there's no reason I'm here. Well, let's explain why Kevin is here and why we're doing this at all. So we talked about uh, pop culture conspiracy theories, and one of which was Andrew W.K. is... uh, was replaced by an imposter at some point was one of the theories we discussed. Uh, somewhat briefly, we kind of gr- gr- we kind of went right past it. Kevin texted me and said, "Quote: I'm looking at my phone right now. Very disappointed in your AWK conspiracy coverage. It's gotten a lot of coverage. AWK himself has acknowledged several times with varying responses, starting to doubt." The credibility of your podcast in general. So now we're doing a follow-up. We're going to talk this that, out. That, that was at 4 a.m. I didn't really <laughs> clarify. Uh, we should also note that it is actually, uh, it's not actually that late, but it's a little late, and we all just came from a party, and we're a little drunky? A little. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit of drunkiness all around. Yeah. Not usually how we do the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show, but this is how I could get Kevin and Pat together, and then Dan was here, too. Because usually we hate each other. So I yeah. had to get everyone drunk, but now we're here. And uh, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Kevin, what was your problem? Well, yeah, it's, it's really, it, it makes sense because when you're talking about alternate identities and conspiracy theory, it, I think it helps to be, you know, drunk. To have, just to <laughs> grease the in, wheels a little. In the spirit of, uh, of just shouting insane things. Sure. So, Kevin, what was uh, your exact problem with uh, our coverage? Right. Which was very thorough and in-depth. Right, yes. So, my main problem was that I felt you guys had a poor source um, okay, so the Andrew WK one was sort of my responsibility to research, and I went to the website. I forget what it is right now, but I mentioned it then, and whatever. I'm sure you can find it. We div- we kind of divvied them up. I don't know if that was clear. In the- and uh, the Andrew WK one was the people that have covered this, notably Gawker, notably uh, well, Gawker pointed at it, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> so the people that had covered this uh, did point to this website, like AndrewWKTruth.com or whatever it was, and uh, it did seem like all roads led to uh, this website, which was extremely poorly written. And I actually think of the ones we covered, uh, that was the one we maybe talked about the least, just because the website was completely impenetrable and it was impossible to get at what he was saying. Right. So, with that in mind, you're saying we had a bad source. Yes, uh, I do. I think there, there's kind of a legitimate Andrew WK conspiracy community, and then there are the outliers who are a little closer to the normal conspiracy community who are the people that believe that the Illuminati are controlling Andrew WK, and uh, that was one of the people that you looked up. 
Uh, and I honestly don't even remember that the Illuminati was involved in the Andrew WK theory as we discussed it. Then they did their job well, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, summarize, what, what is the conspiracy theory with Andrew WK? Because I don't think we did that because I didn't understand it. All right, so, well, first a little background. I am an insane Andrew WK fan. I can confirm that's true. Uh, I would say he literally changed the way I looked at the world in <laughs> high school. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Me and one of my friends formed a religion called Andyism based on the album I Get Wet. And I'm not exaggerating in any way. Kevin used to hate partying. He used to hate partying. <laughs> really? Cool. No, no, it's totally fine. So your belief system is based on a man who, sing, who sings for a living. Uh, not, not necessarily my current belief system. Belief system. A little uh, drunk, a little drunk. We're just little drunk. people. Uh, but so, the way this conspiracy came about was uh, there was a show Andrew W.K. did in December of 2004, I believe, in East Rutherford, New Jersey, in a skate park where he played a particularly short set. First, first like, X-Files conspiracy <laughs> rabbit hole that began with in a skate park in East Rutherford, New Jersey. <laughs> But go on. <laughs> All right, so, well... The heart of evil. <laughs> Andrew WK was always notable for sticking around after concerts and kind of, like, making sure he met everyone that waited to see him. Like, the first time I saw him, probably in 2002, he... The show ended at, like, midnight, and he stayed in the parking lot until 3 a.m. until every single person got an autograph. But not only did he write an autograph, he wrote, like, a page-long inspirational message to every single person. <laughs> so there was a show in 2004 where... Uh, people in the crowd, uh, I did have a friend there, um, reported that he kind of looked different, uh, he didn't have the same energy he usually had, and he ended the set very early, and then he just left very abruptly. So that was the initial start of this, and then right after that time, all these websites started popping up, these, like, very simple, cryptic websites that had uh, numeric codes on them. So love it, love it, keep going. So it's starting to sound a little crazy, but uh, people in the Andrew WK forum community managed to decrypt the code and started uh, getting all the messages, and it was basically things along the lines of, I am the mastermind behind Andrew WK, like oh the guy God. on the stage had nothing to do with it, like he is a fraud, and etc. And there were all these URLs that... Uh, it was revealed that we're actually owned by the Andrew WK Incorporated company. You know, like a lot of bands have. Yeah. So let me, can I, may, may I sort of interject here? Sure. Why would the encrypted messages be a, why would he, why would the record company like reveal these cryptic messages? Like why would, why would they put that out there? Yeah, like they're just essentially calling them own, their, their selves out. Sure. That's very Paul is dead, you know, um, which is a big conspiracy theory. I'm surprised we didn't mention with the Beatles that Paul McCartney similarly was replaced by an imposter. Well, that one's so obviously true, then like why would we even bring it up? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the same thing where like, uh, there's this sinister or weird, whatever, I mean, at the very least, it's weird conspiracy going on and rather than completely covering it up, they leave codes in the music and on the <laughs> album covers. All right, well, so let me jump back a little bit. Uh, there is a person... <laughs> 1822. <laughs> uh, there's a person credited on I Get Wet, Andrew WK's premier major record, major label debut. Um, there's an executive producer credited by the name of Steve Mike, S-T-E-E-V Mike, uh, who is... Very kind of elusive. There's no information about this person. So all this stuff started popping up, and a lot of the information had to do with Steve Mike, and uh, the cryptic messages were kind of alluding that Steve Mike was the mastermind behind everything. Uh, and then later on, Andrew WK released these statements, which were kind of like, this gets very intricate. Uh, That's why we're here, man. <laughs> That's why we got drunk. So, after 2004, Andrew W.K. stopped touring with a full band in the United States, and he also stopped releasing albums under the name Andrew W.K. in the United States. He did release uh, several Japan-only album, Japan albums that were... Uh, one of them was his third kind of full-length release. One of them was an album of J-pop ringtone cover songs. One of them was an album of anime cover songs. So it was kind of like weird. And the idea is that this this gentleman was the real Andrew WK. 
No, not exactly. Well, so he released a statement. <laughs> what is that? I'm gonna not be exact. How many layers? How deep does this go? I'll get back to it. Uh, so eventually, Andrew WK kind of released a statement that was like, "I used to have this person who was very close to me." Andrew WK said this, and this is like on record. You can look it up. I used to have this person that was very close. So www.kevincorrigan.com. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have this person that was very close to me who was a creative collaborator who uh, had a large share of ownership in the Andrew WK image. That's, who is it? Don't fucking, you can't do that. You can't be like, I used to have this person. Wait, oh, Andrew K said this. No, Andrew WK said this. I'm sorry. And he said. I thought you were being like, I used to have this person. No. We, okay. we, I don't know if it helps uh, enjoy this podcast any, but just so you know, right now, Pat is wearing a suit. <laughs> <laughs> so Andrew WK said me and this person had creative differences and we had a parting of ways and because of the ownership of the Andrew WK image uh, it became a big legal battle and I was not able to release albums in the United States under the Andrew WK name I was not able to tour with a full band in the United States um, and I'm not I'm also not allowed to talk about it because it is like a legal issue. He wasn't like so. That's why he left the encoded messages. Uh, no. I mean, who, oh man, I thought I figured something out. <laughs> who knows? But I those are like the things that fuel the Andrew WK conspiracy theorists. There are these things that in real life are unexplained about him. Uh, well, let me ask. Let me let me ask a sort of headier question here, sure. just so we can kind of all jump in here. Um, why, like, why do you think, whether it's true or not, mm -hmm. why do you think fans of Andrew W.K. and the public in general are so taken by this theory of, you know, is he, is he the same? Why, why Andrew W.K.? Why has this theory, because, you know, there, there's other, like, doppelganger theories mm -hmm. out there. You know, what is about this one that sort of, because it really was big on, on Tumblr and sort of, yes. sort of exploded in a way other theories haven't. Certainly are the theories we discuss on our podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you think this one sort of had resonance? I want to quickly throw in that during the podcast, uh, during the original episode, I said that this theory is big on Tumblr. And listening back, uh, when I listened to that again, I realized that what I meant by that was our friend Amanda blogs about it a lot, and she's yeah, on Tumblr. Well, I think that's that's yeah. what I was getting at there. Which, I mean, like, well, Amanda, in terms of the Tumblr, she's sort of like a Tumblr epicenter. She, she does work there, and she has a very popular Tumblr. And, and Amanda was at, and I want to ask you about this. Well, answer Pat's question first. Sure. Um, well, I'm not exactly sure why this has gotten more media attention recently. The theory started back in 2005, mostly on the Andrew WK uh, official message boards. Which what are, are people talking about on the Andrew WK message boards, like, day to day? Mostly Andrew WK. <laughs> it's like, you guys like partying? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's, everything's a lie, right? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Keep going. Um, and the things that gave this credibility were uh, after 2004, Andrew WK kind of had a different physical appearance. He, His face was a lot more demure. He was skinnier. Uh, I will say I'm about 60-40 on this whole conspiracy theory. 60 in favor of he's only been one person the whole time, and then 40% favoring, like, yeah, he might have been two people. Uh, and earlier in Andrew WK's career, because he was always very open and public about his life early on, which kind of faded away over time, but he was always talking about how he was into bodybuilding, and later on he kind of talked about doing steroids earlier in his life and stuff, so he was like huge and then there was a time where he suddenly got like a lot skinnier so that was the same time the conspiracy started so that was one of the things fueling the fire that he is not the same person but also album to album his music has always kind of changed a lot uh i get wet and was like very loud very in your face uh do you he, like any of the albums as much as i get wet because I Get Wet's the one that has, like, if you know any Andrew W.K. songs, right. if you only know a few Andrew W.K. songs, they're probably off of I Get Wet. That's Get the wet. best one. Yeah. By far. Uh, second album, The... Wolf? White Wolf? The Wolf. The Wolf. Um, the second song on it is, I think it's, I forget what it's called offhand, but it is as good as the song on I Get Wet. And over the years, like, revisionist thinking, I think there's a song on it called Totally Stupid, which is probably one of his best songs of all time. But overall, uh, the album was a pretty big disappointment to fans because it was it was a lot slower. It was closer to ballads. So here I got I got I got a 
to me, I'm starting, I'm weave my own web here. It's sort of just like, I could totally imagine a scenario where a bunch of fans are like, the second album sucks. Like, is he less talented? No, no. More rational theory. He's been replaced. Well, that, um, the actual theory was that. I realize I'm sort of de- definitely uh, trepidatiously close to pissing off a very, po- a very fervent Andrew WK fan base. Sure, there, no, but... uh, you're close, but the theory was that Andrew WK, the guy you see on stage, the guy you see in the music videos, was a front man and didn't particularly have uh, a lot to do with the music. I gotcha. And Steve Mike, the guy I mentioned earlier, was the mastermind behind I Get Wet. And once they had the falling out, uh, writing the music was left up to other people, why, which is why there was such a departure in sound between the two albums. I love, uh, I'm just really uh, thankful that, I'm just grateful that you said, like the guy I mentioned earlier, just as- assuming we remembered that. <laughs> that was like five minutes ago. And I'm assuming what? you guys are taking this as seriously as I am. What is the deal the with moment. the show he did in a few years ago at Santos Party House, which is the club venue he owns in New York? Great. Which Amanda, just to bring it back to what I was saying before, Amanda was at that show. I watched, no one gives a shit. I'm like, guys, Amanda, you guys know Amanda. She was at that show. All right, what happened there? I watched the live stream of that show, but let me give you- I tried to watch it to do the research, but the video wasn't loading, and all mm. the recaps were just about how chaotic it was, and I was just like, fuck it, I gotta do more reading about how Stephen King killed John Lennon. I can't focus <laughs> on this right now. All right, let me give you some background to what led to that show. Uh, 1823. <laughs> So, as I mentioned before, Andrew W.K., for a long period of time, was not allowed to tour with his full band in the United States uh, because of legal... They rock too hard. Yes, they rock too hard and legal issues or whatever. That happened to uh, the Kinks. The Kinks never toured in America oh. very much because of, I don't know, they rock too hard. Uh, so, Andrew W.K. started doing a lecture series instead where he did inspirational speeches where people could kind of ask him questions during the show and he'd give these long-winded, very positive messages. He used to have that show, or at least a special on MTV, where he did that, where he like went around to colleges and was very positive and got people, I don't know, out of their rooms or something. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, I got, can I jump in? I, no. I, 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 like, <laughs> You're already here. Jump in. I, I just want to, like, why... I just want to bring this more for a more general kind of... Mm. From a more general audience perspective. Who orchestrated if the Andrew W.K. conspiracy... That's uh, not a what? That, I don't know if that was a question. Who orchestrated the Andrew W. K. Oh, okay, conspiracy? okay. I thought there was an if in there. Well, I am. Um, well, let's hear about that show first. Then we'll get sure. to. Then we'll my, get to my the, answer. The will puppet masters cover your I, question. I, you guys are looking at the the, the details. <laughs> I want to see. I want you know. I'm through the looking glass. <laughs> no, I this. I'm going to cover both of your questions. All right. So uh, he was touring around doing lectures, and he did a lecture in England at a place called Madame Jojo's, where. Uh, I am very impressed with it, that detail. That you like not only know the whole story, but you're like, and a place in England called Madame Jojo's. I am very yeah. far down the ra- rabbit hole. I've spent many nights of my life reading about this. Okay, so we keep interrupting you. Uh, Tell the story. So he did a lecture on stage, and at the same time, he did an interview for a website that the name of that slips to my mind. Uh, but the website posted the full lecture video as well as their interview afterwards. It was like, I don't know. 15 minutes long or more, and during the lecture section, he explained, basically, he was like, this is kind of hard for me to talk about, but Andrew W.K., the character, was created by a group of people, uh, myself included, in the spirit of commerce, and I personally auditioned for the role of Andrew W.K., but I was not the first person to play Andrew W.K., and I am not speaking metaphorically as though I've changed over time. It was di- literally a different human being that played Andrew W.K. originally. So Andrew W.K. said that? Andrew W.K. himself said this. So it seems like case closed, right? Maybe. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the only the, is the argument that he was being tongue-in-cheek when he said that? Um, I don't know if I would say tongue-in-cheek. Personally, but not being, but not... Meant not saying it's, that literally. It's incredible that I went, read that website and it was like so rambly, and at no point was it did it mention. <laughs> and then at one point, Andrew WK said that didn't used to be me. It, it, I, I was a different person. You no, know, it was a different actor playing Andrew WK. Yeah, yeah. That was not in there at all. It was all like 
And when we are done with this page, you will believe a theory that is, um, and if you do not believe it, then you have either not seen the evidence or you are lying. I mean, I, yeah, that does seem pretty, I, you know, and you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to watch it now. You, right. You've done a bit. I will say this. I will say Kevin has done a better job than literally everyone on the previous podcast you and I did, Jeff. All like, those random internet all people. All those random, insane internet people. Like, you, you should really be a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> they, the conspiracy theorist community needs rational people like you. I'm flattered, Pat. Uh, Dan, this you're, has uh, been interesting for me because I know nothing about this. What's your so, take on it? <laughs> well, I, you know, I basically, I'm not even, you guys are down the rabbit hole. I'm not even in the forest. I haven't seen the rabbit hole. I'm not even close to the rabbit hole. I'm on like a well-developed road. Dan's a part Just, of it. Dan's a part <laughs> of it. <laughs> I'm Andrew WK. No, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's really complicated. I mean, like, he, that he admitted to being... An auditioned person, but on, that was, on that on that occasion. But maybe it's occasion. like some Andy Kaufman shit where it's like you know he's yeah. he's messing with us. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's I, like, when once in the rock and roll is a weird landscape because nothing can be taken seriously. Like mm. rock and roll true. musicians yeah. are weird. I mean, like they, they they do anything for any reason. I I I forget what band it is, but there's some like hair metal band whose motto was never confirm or deny. And I I feel like that could be going on here. I do want to clarify that. While I I partially do believe some of these conspiracy theories, I can also see like the logical argument against them every single point. It's just his his persona is so <laughs> unpredictable sometimes. Mm. You kind of have to sort of it's like it's like if you believe if you believe that you have to believe that like Jim Morrison really is the Lizard King, you know? Like, <laughs> people, rock stars say weird things. I'm sorry, do you believe Jim Morrison's not the Lizard King? <laughs> oh, I don't, that's another podcast. I thought you were going to say he's alive, but no, your theory is that he's a Lizard King. Because uh, he screamed it once on stage when he was, like, thigh deep in LSD. <laughs> right, right, right. Anyway, let, let's keep talking about that Santos Party House show. Okay, so let's get back to that. So Amanda's there. She's rocking hard. That, that statement he made in England kind of... Um, a few years earlier, the people on the Andrew WK forums found an IMDb entry for an actor whose profile picture was very clearly a headshot of Andrew WK kind of in a different setting, in different clothes, and he had a different name than Andrew WK, uh, which I don't remember offhand. So that kind of confirmed that theory at that time uh, and set off a big spark of interest in the story around the internet. And as a result, Andrew WK afterwards kind of had to address it again. And the first thing he did was he did an MTV promo where he very sincerely went on and was like, I am a real person. I've been Andrew WK since the beginning and et cetera. That's definitely a level in any conspiracy theory, a milestone when the subject of the conspiracy theory has to come out and deny it. That's that's a big milestone. Like Stephen King does not have to say I didn't kill <laughs> yeah, John Lennon. Yeah. Everyone just figured that out. But Andrew WK, this is, there's enough of this that Andrew WK had to at least acknowledge it. That's that's something. Right. This is this is an interesting conspiracy uh, theory question. Has any conspiracy theory even been close to proven correct? Oh, that's <laughs> a great question. In the history of conspiracy theories of all time on Earth, maybe I mean, Watergate. Does that count? Was uh, that a conspiracy theory? I, I mean, don't know. I think once it's confirmed, it's no I know longer more, considered a conspiracy theory. Yeah, I know more about like Andrew WK and Stephen King than I do about <laughs> President Nixon or any American history. I feel like that's a pretty damning point to make about conspiracy theories that, like, in the history of all of them, none of them have been right. Like that's like that's like that's rough. You except gotta accept the Andrew <laughs> WK. <laughs> It's yeah. like it's weird though. It's a heady question because it's like in the minds of the people who believe them, they're already proven right because like they, there's enough evidence or something. Like, right. what? When is it? Pr- ah, it's, it's so like would the people that that believe in conspiracy that's what, theory become uninterested in it if it actually was proven correct? Would they be like, well, no, I, now I don't want to deal with this. I'm only interested in it when it's like I'm the minority, you know. Nazi moon base was actually proven correct. The Nazis yeah, did Nazi build a moon base. base. It's like, super comfy, actually. They have a lot of really nice couches there. For moon the Hitler came down and he was like, yeah, <laughs> look. <laughs> moon Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> He's different than regular Hitler. He has a moon clone. It's a whole different yeah. Hitler. I, well, totally I don't want to steal the thunder from Moon Hitler, but we're getting off topic. I'm so sorry. All right, yeah. so I'm Santos so Party House. So Andrew WK uh, released these promos. Like the third time Jeff is like, so we're at Santa's party house. Like, <laughs> it's 4.30 a.m. 
Andrew WK started advertising for this event. Uh, he owns a club in Soho, New York called Santos Party House, or co-owns it. And he started releasing these promos that were like, I'm going to do a Q&A at Santos Party House where my fans can come and they can ask me anything they want and I will unequivocally answer it honestly. Uh, so this event happens. It was live streamed online. I watched it online and it went pretty normal. People were asking basic fan questions until the very last question uh, someone finally asked about the Steve Mike conspiracy and Andrew WK instantly got kind of cagey and dodged the question and stormed off stage. But I mean, it, it had a very staged feeling to it. His acting wasn't like especially convincing when that happened. So it seemed like a publicity event. Uh, and I think that's the last time he's addressed the issue publicly. I, you know, I did a few uh, presentations. Uh, uh, this is so weird. I did a few presentations on Paul is the Paul is dead thing uh, when I was in college. I like I did one and then I reused it for a few classes. I took such stupid classes that I could do a presentation on that for several of them. And uh, that was a seven credit course. <laughs> so it, it's a good. Well, it's a good like pu- the first one I did it for was like a public speaking class, and it's a good public speaking subject because there's like visual aids. You can play some songs. Everyone's oh, a little yeah. interested in it. You did your you did your uh, economics uh, report on why <laughs> bubble gum is the best bubble gum, right? <laughs> I did do yes, basically. That was like. I, like, got through college writing ridiculous papers about everything and just coasting by on my charm. But, uh... Which kind of those two things are sort of what this podcast is all about. Like, weird things you're into and how charming you are. So, let wait, I want to get back to... So, the thing about Paul McCartney is dead is that I don't think at all that Paul McCartney was replaced by an imposter. Uh, but I do think the Beatles put a lot of clue... Like, I think they thought it was funny I, to put a lot of clues in there. Like, they definitely deliberately... Let some of the some of them are a reach, but some of them are obviously uh, t- just intentional. Sure. And I guess I sp- the only thing I mean it's hard to guess why, but I think the Beatles are just so famous and like you know I think they thought it was maybe a prank to play on their fans. Uh, is it possible it's something similar going on here? Absolutely. Uh, oh, good. I I don't deny that theory at all. Uh, I totally think. Andrew WK is the kind of guy who seems like he messes, he like he enjoys messing with people's idea of reality. If there's one thing I know about Andrew WK, it's that he likes to have fun and party. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, no, I agree with Kevin though. I think I think like like I think this goes back to something we were talking about before. Like musician uh, musicians, rock musicians, rock musicians in particular are can be very strange and kind of do like to mess with your sort of perception of reality. Yeah, and uh, Andrew WK is also very philosophical. Uh, in his lectures, and also when I Get Wet first came out and was an album, uh, the first page you went to when you went to andrewwkworld.com, which was his homepage at the time, was these journal entries that he would post, just like a blank white page, black text, no formatting whatsoever. They were like these five-page-long, insane, like, philosophical essays that kind of, like, one along the lines of challenging reality and like your beliefs and whatnot. So I feel like he has that part to him. Wait, hold up, Dan. <laughs> what are you? Wait a minute. What are you drawing, Dan? <laughs> this means something. Dan is doodling something been, right now. I've been doodling a map that leads to the real Andrew W. It's a pentagram yeah. with a number on it. <laughs> so we've been going on for a while about this now. Dan, you came into this cold. Are you at all sold that maybe there is an Andrew W.K. Uh, doppelganger? You know, this is by far the most scientific yeah. analysis of this ever To, to answer this question very honestly and not comedically, it sounds like he's the kind of guy that would hear about these conspiracy theories and have decide to have have fun with them. Yeah. I think that's that's the kind of that's that's the conclusion that I've come to listening to all this information and knowing nothing previously to this podcast. That's what it sounds like to me because I don't. But, I but don't, by the way, Dan is a six foot lizard person right now. You can't <laughs> see this. Hats yeah. in a suit and Dan. <laughs> it's super he, hard for me to talk. He keeps with adjusting huge... the way he sits because his tail doesn't fit on the couch. <laughs> I feel like if people hear this, if I successfully manage to post it, mm-hmm. that means it's not true. Because if it was real, <laughs> I'd be intercepted and killed. You would have been shot by now. Yeah, we'd be. We'd all have been shot by now. Uh, the re- I no, mean, I think Dan makes. I, I like Dan's sort of breakdown of it. I agree. As well. I agree. Yeah, a- as I agree. a as a huge Andrew WK fan, uh, and as I said, I so you wait. You like Andrew WK? <laughs> <laughs> I more don't believe it than I do believe it. Uh, the thing I find, but you think it has merit. I think it has merit, and the thing I th- 
find interesting about it is that it is based on things that still have not been explained. Like, still no one knows who who Steve Mike is. There, there's like further conspiracy theories that people think Dave Grawl is Steve Mike. It is weird that there's someone oh, who uh, was a producer on like, this hit album that has no paper trail and like never worked on any other music. I'm yeah. assuming. And then, I mean, it is documented in some ways that. Andrew B.K. had a falling out with his creative partner that prevented him from recording or touring in the United States, and people don't know who that is. And so there, there are mysteries that don't have answers. So I feel like this is a, a liberal way of covering all those bases. Well, <laughs> I'm glad to say liberal when you're talking about conspiracies. It's like <laughs> we did kind of we did kind of just go right past it as we were talking. Like we we brought it up, but we never really dove into it uh, when we did the original episode. So I'm glad that we have given it the attention it deserves, and that now totally you listeners have all the facts or most of the facts anyway. Draw your own conclusions. Certainly more <laughs> of the facts, and you know, uh, draw your own conclusions. I can't wait for the next like five, the, the new Coke guy and the. <laughs> I want to be clear, by the way, like. Do not contact me with like, oh, I have some more information about the Stephen King thing. Like, this is it. We're drawing the line of the yeah. conspiracy theories. This is all of the conspiracy theories we're talking about. If you have more information over who Steve Mike is, email kevin.corrigan at collegehumor.com. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you tomorrow over sober if you want me to leave that in. You're gonna, you're gonna I ask, want you to leave gonna, that in. You're going to ask me to bleep it. All right, it. you know what, guys? We've gotten off track. He's at the Santos Party House. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pat, thank you for coming back. Kevin and Dan, uh, first Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin show appearances, I believe. Uh, let's have you back soon. Thank you for me allow- for allowing me to open your eyes to the light. <laughs> <laughs> and I look forward to actually contributing to a later podcast. We should drink before podcasting more often. <laughs> this is fun. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Good night. Bye. That was pretty fun. I hope everyone enjoyed a little bit of bonus time on top of this week's episode. Next week's episode, gonna be a really fun one. It's gonna be about Action Park, the most dangerous water park that ever existed and likely will ever exist. But that is next week. Let's stay in the present for a little bit longer. Thank you again to Irene and Griffin. If you're in Chicago, go check out Improvised Star Trek Live. If you're not in Chicago, listen to the podcast so you have no excuse for not enjoying their show. Thank you again to uh, Dan and Pat and Kevin. I double-checked with Kevin, and he said, leave that email address in there. So if you want to talk about the Andrew WK conspiracy, go ahead and email him. If you want to email me, I'm at jeffrubin at jeffrubinshow.com, or you can tweet at me. Uh, My Twitter is at jeffrubinshow, and uh, you can get to me at Facebook. And there is, of course... I feel like I'm going to forget something. YouTube.com slash Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin, and Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin.com, home of my Tumblr. Thank you again for listening. Action Park next week. I'll see you guys there.